Hello and welcome to World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, the USS John McCain has become the latest U.S. warship to collide with a merchant vessel when it crashed off the coast of Singapore. Are all these naval accidents just a coincidence? U.S. has launched an investigation into China's alleged theft of U.S. intellectual property in violation of WTO rules. Are the two countries really tearing up on the edge of the trade war? White House chief strategist Steve Bannon has been fired by Trump. What White House faction benefits from the void left by the controversial media executive? And we begin today's program with an accident involving a USS warship. The USS John McCain collided with a merchant vessel off the coast of Singapore on Monday. Early this month, the warship carried out a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea. Before our discussion, take a look at this. The accident happened when USS John McCain was transiting to a routine port visit in Singapore. Ten sailors are reported missing and five injured after the collision. An international search and rescue mission is underway. Earlier in August, the USS McCain went to ensure that sea lanes were open in the South China Sea. It is the second serious collision involving a U.S. Navy ship in recent months. In late January, the cruiser USS Antietam ran aground while trying to anchor in Tokyo Bay. On May 9th, the cruiser USS Lake Champlain was struck by a small fishing boat off the Korean Peninsula. On June 17th, the destroyer USS Fitzgerald collided with a container ship off Japan, resulting in the deaths of seven U.S. sailors. In a report on the Fitzgerald collision released last week, the Navy would review its training and qualification procedures, and the commanding officer and other senior crew would be disciplined. So one after another, what does it mean when another U.S. ship in the Pacific Fleet figured a collision? With us in our Beijing studio, Yang Xiyu, a senior research fellow from the China Institute of International Studies, joining us also from Washington, D.C. in the U.S., who is a managing partner at Watts Pier, served in the U.S. Congress. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. First of all, Mr. Pruitt, I have to go to you how to explain this. Fourth in a row in a year. Seven soldiers already died in a previous accident. This one happened again. Ten missing already. Do not know where they were. So, what is going on here? Well, my father, who was uh, an old Navy member, used to always drill with us that there are policies, procedures, and protocols that, that have to be followed to have a successful Navy. And it seems to me that somewhere in the command system, uh, somebody's not following either a policy, a procedure, or certainly a protocol as it relates to navigation mm. and other seamanship skills. So I think uh, there's going to be, I think, a much broader review needed of U.S. operations in that region. Yeah. And how uh, that operates is going to be, uh, I think, due for some changes. Uh, Mr. Police, if I could follow up by asking you, s some of the senior officials from the USS Fitzgerald have already been punished, so-called, uh, being removed from the post. Do you think that would deter future accidents? Unfortunately, another accident happened just as the news was being announced? Well, no. I think uh, there are clearly some systemic issues at play here that go, again, into either an understanding or the practice of naval procedures, policies, and protocols. And I think uh, until that is weeded out and we either get some new policies in place, mm. uh, we're still going to be subject to human error being displayed in these kind of collisions. Mm. Mr. Yang here in Beijing, mm -hmm. Seventh Fleet, that is the one responsible for this part of the world according to the U.S. Navy. What do you make of the series of incidents and accidents? And how well, does China look at that? Uh, for the latest uh, accident, uh, no detailed information or conclusion uh, come out, but uh, uh, less than one year there have been four such accidents really reflected uh, two points of the, the Seventh Fleet. Number one, uh, 
they are really uh, uh, poor at uh, management and uh, uh, disciplines, especially in the case of the last uh, accident uh, uh, nearby Japan. Uh, but uh, although the four accidents has uh, different uh, reasons, but the poor, uh, uh, poor disciplines and the management uh, in the U.S. Navy is obvious. And uh, secondly, uh, for the neighboring countries in this region, more and more people ask the, this question. Uh, in such a uh, very, very busy uh, sea lanes, uh, does U.S. Navy has been too frequent uh, in, in this area? Mm. Uh, so if we cannot solve this uh, question, I think, I'm afraid that such a uh, sad accident uh, cannot be uh, pre uh, prevented uh, from happening again. Mr. Pui, that's a good question, isn't it? Uh, the U.S. Navy claims to protect the security of its allies by so-called uh, freedom of navigation in the region, but actually it is uh, doing exactly the opposite, at least according to these four incidents. So, Mr. Pui, do you think that there is a legitimate reason continuously for the Navy to be there? And uh, what do you think will be some of the soul searching? Is it only with the discipline or actually there's something with the strategy? Well, I think as the nation with the largest Navy in the world, uh, we uh, in the U.S. are certainly going to have a presence there in that region. I think there are also uh, significant uh, other tensions at play, such as with what is happening uh, between the U.S., South Korea, and North Korea, and how it's playing out with China that will come into play. Uh, losing this one ship has some minor impact, as you could imagine, on the balance of power in that region now, and that may well play into some of our future discussions uh, with the North Koreans about their missile testing as well. So uh, they'll be there, we'll be there, and uh, I suspect that soul searching will go forward. But again, until we get some discipline and some uh, serious review of the mm. policies, procedures, and protocols, uh, we're going to continue to operate until we figure it out. Mr. Yang, how would China respond to that? China, of course, has always been questioning the U.S. purpose. Meanwhile, uh, China has been in some discussion with neighboring countries in the South China Sea about its uh, various issues. What do you think how China is going to take that? And meanwhile, if there were any conflict or collision between China and the United States, well, that's going to be mind-boggling. Yeah, uh, I'm ha I've been uh, thinking of this way. Uh, if this accident happened between a U.S. Uh, warship and a Chinese registered uh, uh, vessel, uh, the political disputes uh, uh, will be quite different from uh, the case now. Uh, so that uh, really uh, raises the question to China, say, in these uh, neighboring uh, sea areas, how to, number one, increase U.S.-China mutual confidence, especially in the very crowded uh, uh, South China Sea. And uh, number two, um, should the U.S. Uh, unlimited increase their the so-called presence or uh, navigation free, uh, on, on, on behalf of uh, freedom of uh, passages? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the fact is like the simple say, the space is uh, limited. The sea lanes is uh, limited, and the economic activities by sea transportation is, is unlimited. Given such a fact, should the military-related activities in this crowded area should be also unlimited by all the powers related, including China and the United States? All right. I guess those discussions are going to continue, not just about this accident, but also in the future as well. Yang Xiyu, Steve Pritt, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. The U.S. has formally launched an investigation into China's alleged threat of U.S. intellectual property. Despite worries about the potential harm to bilateral trade ties, the move comes after U.S. President Donald Trump signed an executive memorandum directing U.S. Trade Representative Robert Zizier to consider the possible initiation of an investigation. For more details on this, as well as China's reaction to Washington's decision, take a look at this. I've always U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer had one year to decide on launching this probe. In the end, it took just four days. It was only August 14th when U.S. President Donald Trump asked Lighthizer to consider launching this investigation. 
Washington is relying on a 1974 trade law, which predates the World Trade Organization in settling trade disputes. The U.S. Trade Representative says the investigation will examine whether China's policies harm American intellectual property rights, innovation, or technology development. Beijing pushed back, saying the WTO is the place to resolve these disputes. Trade measures taken by any member of the World Trade Organization should abide by the rules of the WTO. We have said repeatedly before that as China and the United States are increasingly interconnected with their interests closely entwined with each other, a trade war will get them nowhere, nor will it have a winner, but only leads to a lose-lose situation. Section 301 of the U.S. Trade Act of 1974 has always been unilateral in nature since its formulation and been criticized by other nations. We've also noticed the U.S. has promised to adjust and implement Section 301 in a way that is in line with trade multilateralism. We hope the U.S. can keep its promise and refrain from being the rule breaker of multilateralism. After the Xi Trump Florida summit in early April, U.S. and China announced a 100-day action plan to improve strained trade ties. It seemed like a good beginning. We will safeguard. However, the U.S. is now bringing about the Section 301, putting China under greater pressure. If the U.S. insists on initiating this investigation, it would set a bad precedence not only for China but also for the world. More discussion, China-U.S. trade ties, a lot of things are happening right now in Beijing studio. Xu Sitao, chief economist from Deloitte, China. Welcome, sir. Joining us in Washington, D.C. in the U.S., Scott Kennedy from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome as well. Mr. Kennedy, welcome to our program. After a long time, I want to begin the question from you. Significance of this specific so-called investigation? I think uh, its most important significance is, is that there are uh, important challenges in the U.S.-China relationship and, and, and probably at the top of that list is Chinese technology policy and industrial policy. And one component of that is regard to innovation and intellectual property rights. And uh, there's been a long uh, concern in the United States about Chinese IP policies and IP theft and has had difficulty. Uh, resolving those through the WTO and through uh, uh, dialogue. So I think what we're seeing now is a change of tactics from the United mm -hmm. States to try and uh, reach a, a more equitable solution. Two things, Mr. Xu. One is that, isn't it true that the Trump administration does not believe in international trade mechanism such as WTO? Why referring right now to the WTO for another investigation? That's the first thing. The second thing is, mm -hmm. China-U.S. trade has been increasing so much on mm. the high-tech sector. Sure. That's going to be one of the most significant increase in the future. So can the U.S. also afford these kinds of bad feelings about that part of the trade? Yeah. Uh, as you said correctly, uh, the bilateral trade is extremely important. It's highly entrenched relationship. Right, so it's difficult to say who is winning, who is losing. It's just highly entrenched. Mm. It's, it's mutual in independence. But the fact remains, actually, in the past few years, uh, we have seen this quite a steady increase of trade surplus to China's favor. Mm. But of course, we know it doesn't make any sense to talk about trade surplus deficit just between two countries, right? Internationally, it's so complicated. But nevertheless, I think as um, Scott has said, um, U.S. has decided to change the tactic, mainly prompted by industrial policy in China. Mm. But I also think because what U.S. really wants is greater market access. So <coughs> what is really behind this, uh, Mr. Kennedy? You probably could help us to unveil the mystery of the strategy, the so-called art of the deal. Is this going to be part of the, you know, the art of the deal, the stakes for the future negotiation with China for the Trump administration? Or this is just one of those make-up investigations that the Trump administration has to do in order to win so-called hearts and minds of the, his uh, redneck voters? <laughs> um, I don't. I don't think that this is primarily driven by domestic politics. I do think it. There's been a long-standing concern in the United States about um, our economic relationship with China, <coughs> although mutually beneficial across the board and creating millions of jobs for Americans. Uh, you know, high tech is the most important part of the American economy, mm. and the. the 
lo the most important part of the global economy, which is why China is so focused on it. And there's no uh, uh, criticizing China for trying to move up the value added chain. It's, it's the methods and the approach. And because China is so large, anything it does has global implications. Mm. And I think just the U.S. has felt frustrated. It's brought 18 cases to the WTO. Uh, 16 of which have been concluded, 14 they've won, uh, but they haven't received, uh, you know, the commercial benefits from those cases despite the rulings. And so I think before, th this may end up back at the WTO by the U.S. or by China, right. uh, but before w to get there, I think the U.S. is trying to go uh, through 301 first. All right, but you know, uh, Mr. Xu, talking about whether 301 investigation or you know the steel trade between the United States and some of the other countries, the one that is likely to be most punished is not China. For example, 301 likely to be Japan, South Korea as well. About steel, it's likely to be the European partners, Australia as well. So things are not that black and white. When you say punish China, actually a lot of countries are in the other camp as well. So Mr. Xu, uh, how does China feel about that? Um, I think China would also feel very frustrated because uh, 301 uh, is not about China uh, versus China versus other trading partners because the very nature of 301 is, uh, is very unilateral because that would put the U.S. in the position of, of both a player and a referee. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that, that's, it's, it is unlikely to go down well. Mm. Well, Mr. Kennedy? A player and a referee at the same time, that's quite busy. Uh, well, certainly. Well, well uh, both the United States uh, and China have uh, very large economies. Everything they do has global implications. Uh, Ch China uh, needs to ask itself, what are the consequences of extensive government intervention in, in the economy, including in high tech? What's the best, most effective way to help China move up the value added chain? Is it by uh, engaging in IP theft or is it by supporting R&D and genuine new innovations and protecting that supply chain? And I, I think everyone agreed that the latter would be the best way to move forward. Well, you keep on talking about the so-called IP theft, but you think about China. China has been such a massive market. And when it comes to innovation being tested by the size of the market, it's going to go much further than the United States and even some of the other countries in the world as well. So when people keep on talking about quote-unquote theft as if it were a fact, there are a lot of question marks, Mr. Xu, I have to say. Um, yes, indeed. I, actually, I think um, China has um, made a noticeable progress uh, on the IPR um, uh, uh, front in past few years, mainly because uh, domestic competition, mm. and also because at this stage of uh, economic development, China actually has greater incentive to protect IPR. Um, but uh, I, I do think uh, Mr. Kennedy has made one valid point, mm. because um, certain industrial policy may invite um, retaliation from other trading partners. Mm. So what can China do, uh, Mr. Xu? Because on the one hand, nobody wants to involve into trade disputes. On the other hand, when China's uh, economy is going up, exports still going mm. up, and value added chain going up the, the ladder in its industry, it is very natural that somebody else is going to have an issue with it. So uh, what is the best way for China to handle it, including this one with, with the United States? Um, I think China um, should be patient with the United States. At the same time, I think China um, can persuade the United States to allow Chinese companies to uh, make easier uh, inroad uh, in, uh, for the investment in the United States. At the same time, um, to, um, uh, to open up domestic market further. So that would result in a win-win situation. Yeah, but what about the other way around, Mr. Xu? that the UN, United States also opened up its own market and also invite well, Chinese investment going over there. There are a lot of political obstacles that we all know. That, that's what I'm reports. saying. That's what I'm saying. I, I do think uh, potentially we could have seen much greater uh, investment from China into the United States. And that's really the ultimate solution mm. for so-called uh, trade imbalance. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, we see the economy are doing very differently these days, uh, China and US. China is focusing um, bring up the ladder of this manufacturing, while at the same time encouraging domestic consumption, uh, so-called uh, uh, structural reforms. 
In the United States, you do have a political situation in which jobs have to be so-called priority, and the numbers have to be shown every day from the Trump administration's Twitter. So what do you make of the very different political environment in both countries and the ability for the two to come together for some mutual, mutual growth when it comes to trade, yes. which is good for everyone, Mr. Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, t uh, yeah, Tianwei. Let me just uh, challenge a little bit with your your question. I think actually, the political climate in Beijing and Washington, despite the many differences, uh, have a lot of similarities. We have two nationalist governments. Both care a lot about jobs. Both care about protecting uh, their high tech sectors uh, and manufacturing. Uh, it's uh, but I think what you've and you've also got a willingness on both sides to, you know. Uh, go outside the WTO when they feel it's in, in their interest. The question mm -hmm. is, can we find a balance between uh, the domestic needs and the mutually benef benefits that come from globalization and international trade? I think that we can. I think there's a lot of steps both China and the United States could take to open up both markets. Uh, I'm not in favor of protectionism on either side. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a hot summer in both places. Hopefully, yeah. uh, the fall cooler heads will prevail and the investigation will be a, a starting point for more serious discussions about ways to address these issues. You, what you're saying, there were no serious discussions? I mean, there was a so-called 100-day plan from both sides, and then there were some review of the plan uh, by having further dialogue, and now there um, seems to be yeah, more well, as, uh, of a uh, hammer rather than the carrots. Sure. Well, uh, well, the investigation's not a hammer. It's uh, it's it's and it's not so. But the hundred day discussion didn't really touch on upon this. If you saw the ten point agreement issued in May, it touched upon very minor uh, issues. Uh, and the hundred day and the uh, comprehensive economic dialogue touched on a lot of things, but they didn't reach agreement on anything related to high tech. Mm. And uh, it may seem quick uh, for the Trump administration to act, given that it's only six or seven months in, but this has been a big issue for the relationship for, for many years. Certainly it was part of the Obama administration's uh, strategic and economic dialogue discussions with China. So mm. we'll see. We're obviously moving into some uncharted territories. No one wants a trade war, uh, but we also want to get these issues resolved. You know what, Mr. Xu, there's high-tech companies from the United States that are operating here in China. And to many of them, the Chinese market, the size of it, has already exceeded that their domestic market and their markets elsewhere in the world. So if Beijing retaliate about any further harmful action, as Beijing sees it from Washington in this regard, what's going to happen to our trade? And meanwhile, how to both sides think in the long term and the business community react to the reactions from both sides, Mr. Xu? Well, first of all, um, I think it's too early to talk about tit for tat mm. measures. I think we so far the pronouncement uh, from Chinese government, uh, so far they were quite measured. For example, comments from the MOF Council and so forth. Um, I, if I were not mistaken, uh, President Trump will be visiting Beijing uh, in a few months' time. I'm sure there will be a continued discussion beyond 100-day program. Mm. I'm also quite certain, and and China is already pre prepared to um, open up its domestic market in a meaningful way in certain sectors. Interesting. Well, you probably had more inside information than I do. Mr. Kennedy, before we go, uh, Mr. Bannon is gone from the White House. He was the one proclaimed there's going to be a trade war. Everything else is just decoration of policies for the White House right now. He's gone. Does that mean there's not likely to be so-called an overall trade war? What's going to happen with China and U.S. trade? Can the two sides work well with real articulation? Sure. I, th I think there have, has been sort of three voices inside the Trump administration. Uh, one Please. side sees the relationship basically as fine and needs modest tinkering. At the other extreme, Bannon and his crowd who thinks, you know, China is uh, the biggest problem on the global stage. And then a group in the middle who thinks uh, there are problems in the current relationship with between the U.S. and China, but they can be fixed and you might need to put more pressure on China. I think we're now, even though Bannon's wing is, is much more weakened, we're now, uh, Lighthizer probably is in this middle camp. And so I think uh, we should 
you know, s expect uh, mm -hmm. the coming months to see more pressure and maybe more tensions. Uh, but I think the goal is to f improve the relationship, uh, not become permanent rivals. We hope, at least for people like you. Thank you so much, it's Scott Kennedy. Yes, and absolutely. And Xu Tao. Really appreciate, gentlemen, for being with us. You're watching World Inside with Tian Wei on CGTN, coming to you live from Beijing. So to come on our program, White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon has been fired by Trump. That's been the news over the weekend. Does Trump risk losing his loyal nationalist support base as Bannon walks out the door? Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with Tian Wei coming to you live on CGTN. Let's turn to the White House now. Last Friday, President Donald Trump finally parted ways with controversial far-right chief strategist Steve Bannon. Trump spoke highly of Bannon's great contribution. Neither the White House nor Bannon have clarified the reason for his departure at this time, despite long-running rumors that Bannon has been losing Trump's trust. Bannon was a U.S. Navy officer, Goldman Sachs investment banker, a Hollywood movie producer, and the head of Breitbart News. He took over Trump's presidential campaign in August 2016 to help shape so-called the America First campaign message. Seen as the driving force behind Trump's nationalist populist agenda, his presence in the White House has been contested from the start. Bannon is the sixth person who has left Trump's inner circle now. He's already back at his old job with the conservative news site and, quote, going to war for Trump against his opponents on Capitol Hill, in the media, and in corporate America, end of quote. So what's next after Trump's senior strategist Steve Bannon left the White House? That's a big question mark. A lot of discussion about that. And we're going to have another one here in our studio in Beijing. Yang Xu, senior research fellow with the China Institute of International Studies. Welcome back, sir. Also joining us in Iowa in the U.S., uh, we invited Timothy Hagel, professor of political science from the University of Iowa. And in Washington, D.C., welcome back, Steve Preet, who is a managing partner at the West Partner. Gentlemen, welcome to our discussion. I want to get the views from two American panelists first. So, Mr. Puit, what is your judgment? Is this going to be a White House like no other before? I mean, when Mr. Bannon was still serving as Well, I would argue that, that much of Steve Bannon's impact has already been felt in terms of the agenda that uh, President Trump has laid out over the course of his first seven months in office. Uh, we've still got some significant battles in front of us over trade, uh, negotiation of NAFTA, uh, dealing with uh, our immigration discussions mm -hmm. here in the U.S., uh, any discussion that continues to evolve around a trade world war with China. All of those things are already set in motion. So. Much of his impact has already been felt. I see. Beyond that, I think as he goes to the outside uh, and goes back to Breitbart, uh, he just goes uh, to become another media source in an environment where we already have too much information uh, for any people to truly consume. Mm -hmm. And within the conservative bandwidth, there's a good deal more competition now than when he started All right. Breitbart and his return, uh, unless he does something totally out of the box, he's just going to be another competitor in that space. Well, Professor Hegel, we all understand uh, Mr. Bannon kept a white board in the White House in his office, trying to cross out every task that he let Mr. Trump as a campaigner promised to the redneck voters. And there seems to be some already crossed out, but not necessarily successful. So do you think this White House is going to have a very separate agenda after he's gone? Or as Mr. Pruitt put it, his influence is already very much spread around. 
Well, it's a little bit of both. That I think that I would agree that the agenda to a certain extent is already set, but we've also seen where President Trump has changed direction, if sometimes only slightly, from what things that candidate Trump had said. And plus, I think where Bannon perhaps was felt uh, a little bit more in the White House was the messaging factor. And that's been a problem for the Trump campaign in a variety of ways, not necessarily Bannon's influence, but just in terms of some of the, uh, the, the way things are presented, such as immigration reform that proved to be a real problem in terms of how that was rolled out and dealt with and some other things as well. Mm. And it's true that Bannon will have a lot of competition on the outside in terms of that messaging, but he also has a particular voice and he has his website, Breitbart News, that can project that particular voice of trying to keep Trump on a populist path, but more important perhaps as far as the original agenda is concerned, to make sure that Congress uh, is also on board because mm. of course Trump ran as an outsider, wasn't really in, endeared to the establishment Republicans, and yet they have to get along to get anything done. Right. At the current White House, Mr. Yang, I'm sure as an observer and who has been working on U.S.-China relations is watching very closely, there has been some very interesting drama going on. For example, Mr. Kushner, mm -hmm. which is the son-in-law of yeah. uh, Mr. Trump, and also Mr. Bannon. Yep. as well as Mr. Bannon with the incoming chief of staff of the White House, which has been changing people for quite a long time. Yep. Okay. okay, so how should we understand now who is going to be the bigger voice in the current White House? As you may know, the current president is always want to be a attention star, but who is likely to be there to provide all of these remedies of policies for him to use in order to be the star? Well, uh, I'm afraid that in, uh, in the short term, in foreseeable future, there won't be the uh, largest voice in White House. Uh, uh, after uh, leaving the White House, uh, Mr. Bannon uh, told the truth uh, through the interview. He said the government, the administration, the, uh, uh, the administration was very, very divided. Hmm. And, uh, and that has already been a you know, known fact so for a long time. I think, uh, in the divided situation will continue, uh, not uh, concluded but continue. But also, besides the divided inside the administration, mm. there's a big division between the Capitol Hill and the, the administration. As the and uh, in the larger constant, the, the American people, uh, Bannon said, only 50% of American people support the president. It's a bigger problem facing the United States. So at the administration level, at the politics, uh, politics level, at the uh, society as a whole, no majority voice in the United States nowadays. All right. Division, division, division. That's yeah. what Mr. Young is trying to say. Mr. Poi, to agree with that. And what about that? I mean, President Trump survived and thrived as a result of the division in the U.S. society. And will he continue that path as the president? Well, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Trump has already laid out from his earliest days the fact that he's a, uh, a master of chaos and uh, every day there's more than enough content that goes through the White House process that he could change the subject uh, on any given day two or three times. Uh, as a Democrat and a Democratic uh, lobbyist who is uh, pursuing those kind of policies here in Washington, I can tell you that one of the blessings that we've seen is uh, not that there's been a singular big voice in the White House, mm. but there's been many voices talking into uh, Mr. Trump's head. And as a result, he's not been able to come to any solid conclusions on where he wants to be on any given day, which is why, again, as you've noted, he changes position so often. So I'm, I'm not as concerned about who will become the big voice I do think uh, that uh, General coming in right. uh, as the Chief of Staff will bring some more discipline and probably a little more process to, to the thinking over at the White House, which I think not only for the country, and I don't, mind, I don't mind the battle, but I think in terms of what we see coming forward on the legislative front, will be a, a little more engaged and probably predictable. Uh, he does have a big problem, though, in terms of 
where they've been the last seven months and the fact that uh, you're now starting to see some major fissures within the Republican membership of the House That's right. and the Senate. And it's, it's only a matter of time, I think, if this chaos continues the way it has, uh, that members are going to start heading to the doors. And you have to also focus on the fact that in five months, uh, we start a new election season here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, members' self-survival is far more important in figuring out what the uh, Trump story of the day is. Quite That's frankly. right. Now the Congress is in summer recess. They are all going back home trying to listen what their voters have to say, whether Trump is still an important tool for them anymore or not when it comes to midterm elections. So there we, therefore, I want to go to you, uh, Mr. Hagel, about exactly what's likely to happen because Right now, you see the established Republicans, at least on the issue about the statues and the racial issues, there seems to be a very apparent division between them and Mr. Trump, with given the latter's recent comments. So how big the division will still continue to be, and what would this division mean for the midterm election coming up in the U.S. Uh, is, of course, the most interesting question. It is, and that's where we start to focus is more on the elections and was indicated that the members of Congress, well, they can't do anything if they're not a member, that they don't get reelected. So that's clearly something that's on their minds as well, and that's why it makes it very difficult once you get into the new year, five months, maybe even less, we're talking uh -huh. about it now, that their focus turns on the election rather than the legislative agenda. The problem is, though, is that, of course, if they can't get anything done, that's something that their opponents, plus the voters themselves, are going to be very unhappy about, given all the promises that members of Congress made regarding health care, tax reform, immigration reform, what have you. But if Trump can't get together with the leadership in Congress, given right. particularly in the Senate, the very thin majority that they have there, it'll be difficult for them to get anything done. They can try to blame that to a certain extent on Democrats and their obstructions tactics, but they still have a majority in both houses yeah. of Congress and they have the presidency. And if they can't get something done, it's going to hurt them potentially in the midterm elections. Right. Well, what about the current White House? In a tweet Saturday, Mr. Trump thanked Bannon for serving. He left the White House on Friday and immediately returned as executive chairman of Breitbart News, which he led before joining the Trump uh, campaign. As we have seen what Mr. Trump said about Mr. Bannon, but the question is, Mr. Young, that in the current White House and some of the most important jobs of the U.S. government right now, there are, few, there are 100 jobs likely already being fulfilled, and yet there are three times of 100 that have not been filled. And therefore, people ask, what's going to happen with the policy and the implementation of the policy of this White House? There is, by the way, not new that the White House changed personnel, you know, half a year into the system. But it is quite new that many of the key jobs are not fulfilled. So, Mr. Young, from China's perspective, how do you see that? And will that influence the current Washington's policy toward China? Well, uh, I think uh, uh, Trump administration uh, has been in uh, uh, some kind of uh, lame duck in terms of uh, policy making, for example, relating to American policy to Asia Pacific, uh, including to Japan, to China, to South Korea. There haven't been a political appointee uh, who should be in charge of uh, such a policy review and policy making for the new administration, but not appointed yet. And uh, the problem is, the bigger problem is no timetable for the uh, political appointee. Uh, fill up the uh, uh, positions. Mm. So now every key position from the Pentagon to State Department to uh, the White House, uh, quite a several uh, key positions yeah. uh, are, uh, are managed by career officials. And they are a leader for policy review and policy making. So mm. every uh, counterpart of the United States in Asia Pacific are waiting for a real 
policy, no matter it's a good or bad, positive or negative. Mm. Mr. Poi, it is no secret that uh, South Korea not even have an American ambassador yet uh, talking about the ally relations and the Korean Peninsula situation. Uh, but, you know, what is the best way that the mechanism could work at this point? How much assessment, you know, how much trust uh, the allies or partners of the United States, China included, who has to work with the United States on certain issues, be able to figure out this situation and the system System in order to work on some concrete issues and challenges, and Mr. Poit, very briefly. Well, I think the first thing that needs to happen is a re repudiation of Donald Trump's uh, nomination acceptance speech where he argued that only he can fix things. Uh, the reality is he doesn't know as much about the operations of the U.S. government as we would like our presidents right. to have. And I think as a result, he's not able to fix everything by himself. Uh, secondly, I think many of the people in this city are now focusing on working with members of Congress who have the expertise in a lot of these policy areas to really let the Congress take the lead on defining policy uh, and then let All that right. be presented and forced to the White House and to uh, to our allies we're running out of folks. time running out of time sorry for the three of you thank you so much for joining us i wish i could know the time earlier uh, steve pruitt timothy hagel yang xi Yu, thank you so much for joining us that is all the time we have for today if you'd like to see more try to find us world inside cgtn in your search engine or check out our follow us on twitter facebook and see the way both from me tian wei everyone on world inside team thanks for watching tune in again tomorrow for insights across china and around the world. Good night. Thank you so much.